Hey, Crystal Maiden here, and this is Minish Cap. Obviously, I recorded this on my Game Boy Player, which is why you saw the GameCube logo right there. And this was actually made with a collaboration with Capcom, the same people who made Street Fighter and Mega Man. It's kind of weird. Capcom making a Zelda game. And maybe that's part of the reason why this game is so ignored in the Zelda community. Like, a lot of Zelda fans will go on and on about games like Ocarina of Time and Link to the Past. Games like that, but no one really talks about this game, I find. And that's really weird because this is a fantastic game. There's so many things I love about this. Like, you can change the message speed to really fast. And when I say fast, I mean it because you can hold down the B button while text is scrolling and rotate the the control pad. Well, I'm, I was playing this on a GameCube controller for this, so I was using the control stick. I'm talking about the control pad here. You move the control pad all over the place while holding down the B button, and you can make the message speed scroll incredibly fast. And I love that. Every Zelda game should have that option. Every video game should have that option, but they don't. And the game uses its more advanced technology to give you an intro for the game. A Link to the Past had that too, but it wasn't mandatory to, to watch through. I love the way that the stained glass paintings look, and I love the way the game looks in general. Going from Link's Awakening to this is breathtaking. Like, it really makes you appreciate how much better the graphics are. I like the intro here. Like, I like the way... I like the feeling of the music. And this is Master Smith, who is basically a, a relative of Link. He looks like he should be his grandpa. I think he's supposed to be his uncle. And obviously I'm going to be taking advantage of the fact that you can name your character whatever you want. It should provide some humor value, especially with one line coming up later on. And something I really love that was introduced in this game is the rolling mechanic. You can press the R button to constantly roll and move around really fast before even getting the Pegasus boots. This is the first top-down Zelda game to have rolling in it. And that makes the fact that it was not in Four Swords really glaring. Because in Four Swords, it uses the same graphics as this, but you can't roll at all in that game. And the Pegasus boots aren't nearly fast enough, and because it's a Four Swords game, you can only have one item at a time. So you're barely ever going to have the Pegasus boots to use at all. So, my major complaint with Four Swords is that it's really slow because you move really slowly and you can't roll around. And so it gets really boring and tedious. I know that because I played it on 3DS and it's single player. I talked to him twice by accident. That's gonna happen a lot in this game. And everyone here is talking about the Pickery Festival. Zelda seems to have ADD. They apparently seem to be using the Pickery as a as a sort of Santa Claus thing. Like, be good, kids. Okay, here's something really confuses me. She says that the victor is dressed entirely in black, but when you see him later on, he's very clearly wearing blue. What is it with video games and referring to blue as black. I never understood that. Is that supposed to be some sort of censorship thing or what? We see a lot of we see a lot of characters introduced here and I'll be talking about them later on. Remember how in Link's Awakening I complained about how, how the shield does not allow you to block projectiles until you hold the button? 
Well, it's the same thing here. The only way you can make use of the shield is to equip it to one of your two item slots and hold down the shield button, during which you can't do anything. I mean, I guess you can attack and hold down the shield button at the same time, and that's a pretty good strategy. But there's only two item slots. And you're forced to move really slowly when you're walking around holding the shield up. So they made it even worse than in Link's Awakening. Because in Link's Awakening, when you had the shield up, you didn't have to be constantly moving slowly. Dooku Scrubs were first introduced in Ocarina of Time. And here they're a lot... They're, they're a pretty good presence here, too. Well, I call them Dooku Scrubs. Apparently, they're supposed to be pronounced... Deku Scrubs. That's always weird to me because I pronounce them Dooku my entire life. And I have no idea why I call them Dooku because it doesn't, it's not spelled that way at all. It's D E K U. But for some reason, I always call them Dooku. So that's how I pronounce it. The sword here looks pretty much exactly like the. The master sword in Wind Waker. But it's not. So that's kind of weird. And here's Vati. Well, I guess it's pronounced Vati. Because in the Legend of Korra, they they had a villain named Vatu. And he, he had two A's in his name. V-A-A-T-U. And it was pronounced Va, not Ve. So I guess he's pronounced Vati? Nope. I always called him Vati when I was a kid. But apparently he's it's pronounced Vati, but I'm never going to pronounce it that way because I never called him that as a kid. Vati is a pretty generic villain. He's evil because reasons. I mean, I guess the, the manga sort of gives a backstory to him, but it's all implied and never outright states that that's the reason that he's a jerk. It just... His mentor is sort of partying around without him. <laughs> I kind of like his dialogue, but he's such a generic villain. And why did... Like, that previous scene made no sense, because he had his shield up, and the spell that would turn something to stone hit the shield. Okay, logically, two things should have happened. Either the shield itself should have been turned to stone, or Link should have been turned to stone. But instead, the shield is magically immune to the spell, but while it protected him, it also caused him to get knocked to, to the side? Why? So you get two swords, one of which you can't actually use. And this map is unique in that it's it's split up into sections. Every different area in the game is sectioned off. Unfortunately, most of the areas still have the same music. Like, the field areas all have the same music to them. But, nevertheless, I think it's a much better overworld than A Link to the Past. And one of the reasons is that there's so many different distinct areas that have their own distinct themes to them. Like in Link to the Past, you had a desert area, but it didn't play different music from the rest of Hyrule Field. Here you have all sorts of different areas, and they feel distinct because they have their own distinct themes. And you have to do a lot of backtracking in this game to get all the treasure, but I don't entirely mind that because this is my favorite overworld in all of Zelda, so I really don't mind going through it all the time. Plus, it's pretty small, it's not- doesn't take too long to backtrack through all of it. And you can warp later on, so it's really no big deal. Lon Lon Ranch was a concept that was first introduced in Ocarina of Time. Because this game was made after Ocarina of Time, there's a lot of references to it, but it's not outright obnoxious. It's just... It's very clear when this game was made. Link even looks a bit like Wind Waker Link. Because of when this game was made. This house is entirely pointless. 
Like, you'd think there'd be a key in here or something, but no. And <laughs> the graphical glitch there. He, his, the jar was covering up his head. They really didn't anticipate that you would be holding a jar while you collected your first rupee. And do they really have to tell you what a rupee is when you first get it? Do they really have to tell you what a heart is when you first get it? I mean, I'm pretty sure I could have figured that out on my own. Link's Awakening is the top-down Zelda game that introduced all the hand-holding, but not even it did that. I remember using codes to get all of the items from the very beginning, including the fully upgraded sword. But the problem is, if you use if you use an item that Hatless Link isn't supposed to have yet, then his sprite completely glitches up and the game freezes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I very intentionally tried to make it so that him getting hit by the Octorok rocks were perfectly timed with the music and everything. Ezlo is kind of annoying. He's... He's a helper character. He's an exposition fairy. He's not nearly as bad as Navi, though. He's a lot more helpful, I think. Because I think the problem with Navi is that she gave you advice that was too obvious, but she didn't really give you any useful advice. Yeah, I chose Z because I'm used to Z on the virtual console being select, but apparently X is select for the Game Boy player. Yeah, Ezlo has a whole bunch of different things to say, and the things that he says change depending on when in the game you are. I'm not gonna show off all of his dialogue because that would take forever and I run out. I run out of things to say, and it wouldn't be that interesting. I mean, this this LP is long enough as it is, so I'm going to be cutting a lot out. Like all the backtracking, I'm going to be cutting out. I'll just show me. I'll just show me getting the treasure, and that's it. So apparently, the tiny people called the Pickery that were talked about in the festival, they're actually called the Minish, because that's what they call themselves. And this comes from a pun, where Minish is basically short for Diminish, because you diminish and you get tinier. When you're tiny and you're in the overworld, then you're pretty much helpless, because you, you can swing your sword, but it's completely useless. You can't actually attack anything with it. And you move pretty slowly, so desperately rolling constantly trying to move really quickly. And you go into shallow water and you drown in it. It gets a little bit better though, but not by much. It's a little different from the dialect I'm most familiar with. Foreshadowing. Yeah, after hearing that I'm surprised that I was surprised by the plot twist. I don't actually clearly remember my first experience with this game, because I played it so long ago. Like, I have so many memories with this game. I have a lot of nostalgia for this, because I had it for such a long time. I like the music of this place. This village has a lot of charm. There isn't really much to it. There's not much that you can do there. There's no shops that let you buy anything. There's not even any facilities that would make sense to have around to make the village be able to run. Like, I guess this counts as a facility, but it doesn't really help the Minish themselves. Oh, here's something bullshit. The game actually tries to give an explanation for why rupees and hearts appear with cut grass. But the problem is, Minish are in this game and this game only. They go back to their own world after this game. So that's not really a good explanation. 
And I'm not the only one who is annoyed by this either. So in the next part, we'll be going to the first dungeon in the game. See you then.